Stand with me as we uh, read our call to worship and then have prayer and we'll get started. Call to worship comes from Psalm 30, verse 4. It says, Sing praise to the Lord, you, his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for this beautiful day, grateful for this place where we can gather as the body of Christ. Father, as we gather this morning and lift up praise and worship to you, we pray for your presence, and we pray that we, we may glorify and honor you with all we say and do. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
this time of the service, you've heard me tell you many times, is the most important time of the service. But I should also tell you that as the preacher or as an elder standing up in front of the body, I have very little to do with how important it is to you. And you have everything to do with how important it is to you. As we walk with him, as we talk with him, we focus on being his own. That's individual. We share the emblems together. But this is the most individual time that you will have probably this entire week with the Lord. And it's the time where you focus on this cup of juice and the blood that he shed. And this wafer and the body that was broken and given for us. And we get to make it personal. We get to say thank you for loving me so much. For sacrificing for me. This will always be the most important time of a worship service. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful. Grateful that we have the opportunity to come to your table. Grateful that we have the opportunity to, to say thank you for the amazing love that you've shared with us. We thank you that you sent your son and he was willing to come to sacrifice his body and his blood. Father, help us to always remember that. Help us to, to live a life that's worthy of that sacrifice. Bless us as we come to your table this morning. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
great importance and power to be found in praise and worship. Our, our text this morning is going to come out of Psalm 92.1 as, as we talk about praise and worship. If you turn to Psalm 92.1, this is what it says. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. You know, if, if I took a poll this morning, if I were to ask people in churches everywhere, why are you here? Why do you come to worship? Why do you come to a praise service? Those answers would be very, very different. It would depend on your age. It would depend on, on your family. It would depend on where you are in or out of a relationship with God. You know, there are many people in a worship service this morning because they don't have any choice. My mother and father never asked me if I wanted to go to church. Ever. They didn't wake me up on a Sunday morning and said, Rod, you want to go to church today? No. It was, get up. We're going to be late. My dad always thought he was going to be late. You see, the reasons why we gather are common in some areas and very different in others. There are many, most, who are gathered today to honor and to praise and to glorify God and to be strengthened by being together. I would say the vast majority are that way. But there are those in the assembly today that aren't terribly excited about being here. And the younger you are, that probably applies to you. There are those who believe that it's an opportunity to network. I've met a lot of business people in my life that go to church and they work it. And then they go to church over here, and they work it. That's a reason to go. It's not a great reason. But maybe some of what they need will rub off on them while they're here. You know, there are those that are going to church this morning so that they might be entertained. And if you can't make it entertaining... If you can't keep their attention for a little bit, they're not going to be back. It's not worth their time. And there are those who attend a worship service to further an agenda, 
to consolidate power, to have control. The main reason we gather on a morning like this is to honor and glorify God. And we have, we have messed with the worship service so much. We think a worship service is all about us. And it has so little to do with us other than our participation, which is very important. You see, worship is worth-ship. It is our opportunity to show God what He is worth to us. Not the other way around. We gain something from being in God's house. We gain something from being in God's house. Even on those mornings we don't want to be here. That's the way God works. Because when we are here, we gain something that we cannot gain anywhere else. And you know, the pandemic has created an issue for us. Because we've got a lot of people that think that they can get everything that they need from the church at home in their pajamas. I had a good friend, ran into her, her boys and... JT played ball together, and we were talking back and forth, and she said, you know, I kind of like going to church in my pajamas. But you see, she misses so much when she's not there. She misses the opportunity to share of her gifts and her talents and her abilities and she can't be fed by the abilities and talents and gifts of the others. We need to understand that a Sunday morning and a worship service is our opportunity to offer a gift of God to God at all times. It doesn't cost us anything other than our time and our effort to be here. The Bible says a great deal about praise and worship. The Psalms is full of references. In Psalm 63, it says, O God, you are my God, I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, thus I have seen you in the sanctuary. To see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied with marrow and fatness. And my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. Psalm 71, verse 8. My mouth is filled with praise and with your glory all day long. In verse 14 of Psalm 71, it says, But as for me, I will hope continually, and I will praise you yet more and more. In verses 22 through 24 of Psalm 71, it says, I will also praise you with a harp, even your truth, O my God. To you I will sing praises with the lyre. O Holy One of Israel, my lips shout for joy when I sing praises to you and my soul, which you have redeemed, my tongue also will utter your righteousness all day long. For they are ashamed, for they are humiliated, who seek my hurt. In Psalm 119, verse 164, seven times a day, 
I praise you because of your righteous ordinances. I read that and I thought, ooh. I wonder if I even think about God sometimes, seven times a day. And I'm the preacher. You see, we can get so caught up in everything that's going on. In every part of our lives that we forget God's always there. And He needs to be praised. And He needs to be worshipped. And He needs to be glorified. And it doesn't take much. But we have to pay attention. In Psalm 146, verses 1 and 2, it says, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord, O my soul! I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. We are invited by the Scripture over and over and over again to praise God. In Psalm 107, verse 8, it says, Let him give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Psalm 135, verses 1 through 3. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is lovely. Psalm 147, verse 1. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant And praise is becoming. It looks good on us. You know, there are things that we wear that don't necessarily look good on us. I bought some new clothes here recently. I bought a pair of tie-dyed shorts. My wife says, I don't ever want to see those on you. And she's probably right. They won't look good. Because the color in the catalog didn't match the color that came. And, and I'm not much about wearing pink anyway. So, But praise always looks good on us. It always looks good on us. And God loves it when we praise Him. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. He says, make some noise. Let God know. Let the world know that you are praising. We are encouraged. We are instructed to praise. Because quite frankly, praise is far superior to anything else that we can offer to God. It's the best thing that we can do. So real quickly this morning, I want to examine three areas where it's better to praise. And the first is, it is better to praise than to panic. It's better to praise than to panic. You know, it's it's easy to praise God when things are going well. You know, you're having a great day. Things are smooth. It's when things get bumpy. When things get tough. That sometimes we forget. And instead of panicking, 
We just need to praise through the difficult times. In John 16, Jesus told the disciples, he had just got done teaching them a great deal. And he says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus says, I didn't tell you I'd take away your tribulation. In fact, Jesus says, you're going to have tribulation. But he also says, take heart. Because I've overcome the world. And that tells me that any tribulation I face can be handled by God. So I shouldn't panic. There are many panic producers. There are circumstances that we have no control over. There are circumstances that we create ourselves. You know, health problems can create situations. The economy can create situations. Pandemics can create situations. Family relationships can create situations. And we can praise God through them all. How? How? Well, first of all, we do it by remembering the promise that Christ made that he was always going to be with us. Matthew 28, verse 20, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. We need to remember that God loves us and that he proves that through the death of Jesus on the cross for our sin. Christ promised we would never be alone. This is a verse of scripture that we read and probably just skip over. But I like it. And one of the reasons I like it is I'm an adoptive parent. But John 14 verse 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In those times, we could panic. We need to praise. Because God has promised us that we are not alone. In John, the 14th chapter, verses 16 and 17, he's talking to the disciples, preparing them for the fact that he is about to die and is going to be leaving. But he makes this promise to them. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. We face difficulty, but we can praise God knowing that we have God's peace. John 14, 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Secondly, it's better to praise than to be pessimistic. You know, pessimism is a way of life. We all know people that are pessimistic about everything. There's something wrong with everything. Or they look at a situation and, and instead of looking at how it's going to be great, they talk about what's going to happen and it's going to fall apart. You know, we're kind of like that farmer that had this great dog. This dog could do all kinds of tricks. I mean, all kinds of tricks. Roll over, play dead, fetch. You know, bark on command. The farmer had a pond. And the pond had stepping stones in it just under the water. Well, the farmer had a, a, a neighbor that was pessimistic about everything. The weather, the crops, everything was going to be bad. The farmer's trying to cheer him up. He said, hey, look at this great dog. And he called the dog, and the dog ran across the stepping stones like he was walking on the water and jumped into the farmer's arms. And his neighbor said, can't swim? 
You see, there's pessimism everywhere. We cannot allow pessimism to take control of us. We have to overcome it. I believe Christians need to be optimistic. Optimism is a part of being faithful. Optimism doesn't wait on facts. It deals in prospects. And that's how faith works. That's how faith works. You don't have to see something to have faith that it's going to happen. And you can't have faith and be a pessimist, in my opinion. Someone once said, pessimism is a waste of time. It's far too late, and things are far too bad to be pessimistic. There's probably truth in that. Pessimism is doubt in action, and for the Christian, it's telling God, I don't trust you. I don't believe in you. We've been called to live by faith. In Romans, the first chapter, verse 17, Paul said, For it is in the righteousness of God is for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. You see, our faith in Christ, our faith in his promises, allows us to expect the best in our lives. Romans 8, 28 is a very familiar verse of Scripture. And it says, we know that God causes all things together to work for good to those who are called according to His purpose. He doesn't say all things will be good. But He does say that all those things can work for our good. We are not promised that we won't have difficulty. We are not promised that we won't have trial. But we are promised that God would use it all to build our faith. The last thing. It's better to praise than to worry. Are you paying attention? And I look at my wife when I say that. I love her. I've been married to her for almost 48 years. And she still wants to worry. She tells me it's about being prepared. Okay. You know, we shouldn't worry about those things that we have no control over. But we do. <laughs> we do. That's part of being human, I think. The real thing for us is to understand that Sin is our problem, and Christ is the cure. Everything else falls right there. We've all been affected by the fall of man. We've all been affected by our sin. And we can't allow ourselves to focus on our, how we failed or what we did wrong. But instead, we need to focus on how we overcome. And that comes through Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he told them several things. First of all, he said, don't worry about anything. I, I, I make my wife a little crazy because she doesn't think I worry enough. Or maybe she thinks I should be a little more concerned than I am. Paul says, don't worry about anything. I try not to worry about anything. Then, he says, trust God. Trust God for everything and accept His peace. Trust God for everything and accept His peace. Philippians 4, verse 7, he says, And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
That means we've got to give up control. And that's hard. Finally, he says, think only of praise. Don't think about the other stuff. Think about praise. Think about how you are going to praise God and what you are going to do to do that. In Philippians 4, 8, Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think on these things. That's where our focus has got to be. That's where our focus has got to be. Because if we can learn to praise in every situation, we will never, ever be overcome by our problems. We'll have them, but they won't overcome us because of Christ Jesus. And that's the way we praise. That's the way we worship. Doesn't have anything to do with how good or bad the preacher is today or how good or bad the song service was today or if we had a praise band or didn't have a praise band or if it was too loud or they were singing off key. It doesn't have anything to do with any of that. It has everything to do with our focus. Why we're here. What we expect while we're here. And accepting what God's willing to do for us while we're here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. And we, we pray this morning that as we have worshipped and praised you, it's been acceptable to you. Because we are so grateful for your promises and your presence. Help us to always be mindful. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise and worship are powerful tools. And we all possess the ability to do so. You can praise and not be able to sing a lick. You can worship through your actions. You can worship through caring about one another. Our praise and worship demonstrates our faith. Our faith in God. Our faith in Christ. And I guarantee you, when other people see you exercising your faith, they're going to be moved by that. They're going to wonder. And they may be coming to you and saying, tell me about him. Tell me about your faith. We get the opportunity to praise him by sharing the truth. You know, we close our worship services every Sunday with an invitation. It's not my invitation, never has been. It's not the invitation of the Onward Christian Church, it never has been. But it is God's invitation. It's his invitation to establish a relationship with him through his son. And the Bible says that if you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, if you will repent of his sins, confess him before men, and be buried in the waters of baptism, you can have your sins washed away. Be filled with his spirit. And you're on your way to a life of praise and worship. If that's something you need, you come as we stand and sing.